guess I'm just sure you need to understand if I need to use this to read with. And also that I have the right to read because then my memory is kind of not on par as it's supposed to be. Uh, good evening and welcome. I would like to begin by quoting Dr. Bruce Perry from the Child Trauma Academy. We humans are the most complex and puzzling of living creatures. We can create, nurture, protect, educate, and enrich. Yet we also degrade, humiliate, enslave, hate, destroy, and kill. A man can tenderly hold his newborn and moments later beat the baby's mother. Violence permeates our human history. Interpersonal violence, the topic of this summit, refers to violence between individuals and is subdivided into family and intimate partner violence and community violence. The former category includes child maltreatment, intimate partner violence, and elder abuse, while the latter is broken down into acquaintance and stranger violence and includes youth violence, assault by strangers, violence related to property crimes, and violence in the workplaces and other institutions. The focus of the summit is violence against our youths, child maltreatment. A recently released PAHO survey of 955 young people in Cayman shows that one in every five of our adolescent female reported sexual abuse. One-tenth of all the participants stated they have been sexually abused by a family member or another adult, with the prevalence of sexual abuse being six times higher, 18.6% for female than males, which was 3.1%. One in every six has experienced physical assault by an adult. The survey also shows a high percentage of mental health issues impacting the participating youths who reported incidents of depression, anxiety, loneliness, and a high level of suicidal ideation. The figures in that is 22.6%, which you might be interested in knowing that that is higher than the other Caribbean, English Caribbean speaking countries, um, fifth, which is 15 to 18 percent. In addition to the PAHO survey, we have data from the program coordinator of at-risk youths that identifies 600 at-risk young people in our school system who are under the age of 18, and 300 juveniles involved in our legal system who committed a total of 1,000 offenses during the time period from 2009 to 2013. For those of us involved with youths, the PAHO information is not new. The fact that it made the news is a positive beginning. However, such collection of data that informs us is not helpful without action. Action is required. Before outlining the required action, it is important to briefly review some facts. It is well established that violence and factors associated with violence are multidimensional and complex. We need to understand these factors and their impact on our children's development and on our society. Numerous research show the impact of newer development. We know that exposure to violence triggers a roused state of fear, cognitive deficits, and behavioral changes among our youths. We know that the brain's ability to process information focus and remember is affected in youths exposed to abuse and violence. We know that damage to areas of the brain that deals with learning, memory, and attention occurs. Therefore, these youths have difficulty focusing, processing information, and learning in school, and may behave in problematic ways. Youths also experience behavioral changes, such as difficulty in sleep, aggression and agitation. Additionally, poor so problem solving, damaged self-esteem, and hopelessness have been clearly linked to negative and traumatic life events. Also, medical research shows that excessive exposure to violence will alter the developing central nervous system. This predisposition, ah, sometimes I can't talk. <laughs> this predisposes, help me somebody, the victim to be a more impulsive, reactive, and violent individual. 
Consequently, violence can breed more violence. Let's take, for example, the impact slash damage of violence in child sexual abuse. In addition to robbing a child of the innocence of childhood, the child also suffers emotional, psychological, cognitive, behavioral, and neurodevelopmental damage. Numerous research also document resulting nightmares, flashbacks, low self-esteem, feelings of helplessness, isolation, guilt, shame, anger, sadness. Trust is shattered and the child's sense of security and safety is lost. Additionally, a sexually abused child is at risk for displaying sexualized behavior, sexual promiscuity, engaging in self-destructive behaviors, engaging in fire setting, experiencing intense psychological distress. <laughs> Additional damage can also occur when children try to make sense of the abuse by concluding that they are bad, or when adults respond by concluding that the child asks for it or is lying. The bottom line is, child sexual abuse, in addition to being a crime, changes a child's world forever. Our damaged children without intervention can live tragic lives and in some cases damage other lives. Furthermore, the impact of interpersonal violence is not confined to affected individuals. Our communities and society are also affected. There are biomedical impacts such as long-term negative health effects re reflected in chronic diseases, alcoholism, psychiatric problems. There are economic costs for these health services, for foster care, schools, criminal justice system, and incarceration. Prior to outlining our best community response, let's look at some possible societal blocks to responding. Similar to other societies, some of us are threatened by child sexual abuse. We feel unprepared to deal with it, we are reluctant to report it, we would like to pretend it does not happen. Also, there's a natural reluctance in many of us to believe that children, when they speak about being molested, especially if there's no physical evidence, that something happened to them. Most of us do not want to believe that children are being hurt in such a painful way, and do not want to believe that a nice parent, man or woman, could do such a terrible thing. There are also concerns about impact on the family, such as resulting separation or the financial aspects of it. Here are some suggestions that would be helpful in reducing the impact of interpersonal violence, specifically the impact of child maltreatment on our youths, family, and society. Knowing that child abuse is a traumatic event that harms a child emotionally, psychologically, physically, cognitively, we need to take necessary measures to prevent the abuse of our children, to protect our children, to help those affected by providing supportive services that will foster healing. Our best community response begins with an understanding of the problem, the contributing factors, and impact. This is needed to guide appropriate interventions. Our best response required that we accept that as a society, we are responsible for the health and welfare of our children. Only by this acceptance can we assume the public and moral responsibility that we have to our children and adolescents who are abused, at risk, and are in need of mental health services. We need a societal response that will endorse the formation of a mental health program with its own allocated budget for human resources, needed services, programs, and a system for collection of data so that evidence-based decision-making can occur. We need a comprehensive approach that will treat mental health as a primary issue in child health and welfare. As a society, we need to endorse a comprehensive policy with a company budget that will offer the following training. We need to conduct educational and informational workshops for teachers, parents, healthcare providers, legal personnel. 
The following have been documented to be helpful and cost effective. Provide education and guidance to parents and equip them to teach their children about abuse, to have a good relationship with their children, to listen, and to reassure them that it is safe to talk about anything. Annual training workshops for teachers and health practitioners to detect signs of child abuse. Trained multidisciplinary teams comprised of clinical staff, law enforcement staff, legal personnel, and social service to conduct victim-sensitive forensic interviews of children who are abused. This will prevent re-traumatization of children. Also, we need ongoing public education on causes, risk, and prevention. Secondly, recommended is treatment. Treatment is needed for those affected. There are effective treatment approaches for children and youths traumatized by violence. We need to ensure that children exposed to interpersonal violence receive comprehensive, specialized mental health services from trained, effective clinicians to foster healing. A child or a youth does not get over it, and time does not heal such a wound. Without treatment, the abuse can mess up the rest of a child's life. We know that untreated, abused children suffer lifelong effects such as low self-esteem, feeling unlovable, unworthy, and not deserving of respect. They experience problems in developing and keeping close relationships, difficulty in trusting, difficulty in physical, emotional, and sexual boundaries. They develop eating disorders, sleep disorders, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative disorder, borderline personality disorder. We know that they're also at risk for re-victimization or victimizing others and may become addicted to drugs or alcohol or experience sexual dysfunctions as adults. We know that the majority of our incarcerated population, youths and adults, was damaged as children. Hence the profound relevance of the term hurt people, hurt people. Those who are incarcerated for child maltreatment also need professional help. Society should recognize that these individuals have a problem and need help. Therefore, in the criminal justice system, we need to focus on rehabilitation by addressing the needs and risk of prisoners. We need sexual offenders treatment program inside the prison and in the community. We need also community intervention programs versus incarcerating our youths. Another factor that's important is prevention. <laughs> a key focus should be on prevention. We need to take necessary measures to prevent the abuse of our children, to protect our children. This will require funding, implementing an array of strategies and interventions to address root causes, and it must include education, training, evidence-based treatment, focused community programs, programs and services for or at youth risk, at, at risk youths, I got it, programs for incarcerated youths and programs for families. We need a coordinated approach which has been clearly documented to be more cost effective and efficient in addressing these needs, issues, and risks. The task before us, therefore, is to build a coalition with agencies involved in mental health, involving mental health professionals, social services, education, community leaders, parents, law enforcement, general practitioners, faith-based leaders, and youths. Also, child mental health should become a major component of healthy development. Therefore, we should work to enhance the capacity of primary care and education setting through training and support so that they can recognize and provide services at a subclinical level. We also need a perspective. We need public health effort that is based on collection of data that demonstrates the effectiveness of intervention. We need a new approach where the practice of public policy must be the practice of psychological science. There's no bias there. 
one that will not only focus on sciences of economics and politics, but on the moral basis of a concern for our children. One that will place evidence from psychological science in the foreground when public decisions are being made so that the influence of shaping public policy become a more permanent one. For us trained professionals, we need to do more to shape public policy. Long-term success will only be achieved when we demonstrate the value of scientific research and the value of the scientific method in guiding public policy. Whatever services and interventions we undertake, let us begin to engage in evaluating and documenting their effectiveness. We also need to assume roles of prevention scientists. To successfully address interpersonal violence and other issues that impact our society, we need a perspective of unity based on the fact that we're all in this together. In addition to the provision of direct treatment, professionals need to work with others in prevention, consultation, education. We, all, we can all work together to protect our most precious resource, our children, our future. And finally, to avoid at all costs the tragic response to interpersonal violence where we become desensitized and view and accept violence as a way of life. In moving forward, there's a need for caution. Like many societies, we have a tendency to shelve rather than to be guided by such reports. As previously stated, such collection of data that only informs us will not stop the unraveling of the basic fabric of our society. Action is needed. I would like to end as I started by quoting Dr. Bruce Perry. A society functions as a reflection of its child learning practices. If children are ignored, poorly educated, and not protected from violence, they will grow into adults that create a reactive, non-creative, and violent society. I would like to commend the organizers of the summit and you, the participants, for taking the first step in ensuring that we do not choose this road. Thank you. Wow. When I read her talk, um, I was I was pretty impressed, and I thought that was an amazing, you know, just pile of information. And I would I would love to get her permission to disseminate that um, in written form, publish it somehow, uh, if I can. But I'll talk. But before we move on, I mean, I really think it's important to digest all of that a little bit so far. Um, any, I mean, how do you feel? Let's start with how do you feel? After hearing that, you might have just picked up a few things, maybe you, you know, got stuck on some things, but I'd like to know what stood out for you. Um, <laughs> the issue of, of policies being informed by scientific research, etc. Wait, 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 how do you feel? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, that's the first one. <laughs> um, I'm relaxed at the moment. But I'm, I'm very excited that, that, that we're actually here to, to look at that. So that's the first view. Okay. Um, on the issue of policy, though, um, <clears throat> I am personally not, not exactly sure about what the policy framework is with relations to how connected the institutions are um, in, in, in dealing with with any kind of trauma. So I just you know want to get a real real sense of that. I, I've worked in the system and sometimes to an extent it seems disjointed sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but what what policies do exist that encourages real and true collaboration. Okay, so you are curious or you are dubious about what informs policy? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about what really okay. informs the policy. All right. So I'm to make sure I get it. Yeah. Somebody else had their hand up? Oh, yeah, I had my hand up. Um, I feel like I can, I'm exhaling because I have had a lot of ideas. I don't know how to put it into practice. And it, I, it's good that other people have that, because I know we're probably all from different organizations and have different perspectives on the organization that you're in. But um, she mentioned um, 
like law enforcement, what I see, because I, I deal with kids and I deal with incarcerated adults, and I see the whole spectrum. And um, like from a law enforcement um, perspective, sometimes like, for example, my mom's a magistrate, and she will be like, oh, I have this one guy, and he keeps coming back, or he keeps testing positive, and I'm like, okay, well, look at it from this perspective. You guys aren't dealing with the root issue. If you don't deal with the root issue, you're gonna keep having ongoing problems. And so I, I really want um, like people in position, like especially in the courts, to get training on um, why they're doing what they're doing and why they're there in the first place. Because a lot of the times they just wanna put them in prison, but there's no rehabilitation. And so you just get um, probably a, a, an adult that has a criminal record that then now can't get a job and then doesn't have money and has to resort to crime to then survive. So it's like this cycle and I wish that they could understand that cycle a little bit better okay. so that we could fix the problem. <coughs> fear-based stigma. I think it's something they don't understand. I mean, okay. if somebody has a broken arm <clears throat> or a heart condition, people understand that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that stands out for me from Dr. Augustine's comments was the word integration and just how the importance of integration when it comes to child and youth mental health in particular um, having, having worked in both adults and in child systems, in, in, with child and adolescents, the child's life um, is so informed by school as well as the home environment and the community. And so to not think about all pieces that have to be integrated, compared to in the adult system, where people often, if they're dealing with mental health, might isolate themselves from family, can isolate themselves from you know, work or school. As a child, you can't. You can't escape the school lane and the home environment. So I think integration in terms of treatment and assessment is really important. Anybody else before we come? Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that I feel privileged to be one of the few guys here. <laughs> and it's a coincidence that we began by asking us our feelings, which a bunch of guys would probably not do. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have some other points I'd like to get into, but probably don't have time now. But the two, two main things off the top of my head is that it's not just uh, targeted, as you all know better than I do, problem, but it's systemic. And it, um, it's broader and wider than I think we appreciate because there are a lot of cultural considerations alone, and I'll just stop at that. But it's you're not leaving, are you? No, no, no. But have other points, but I don't want to help. No, that's good. Yeah, we'll have more time to talk. But I, I'm actually going to speak to that as well. So maybe you'll you'll chime in after that. So. talking about um, penalizing kids who have grown up with 
um, issues. But I think also one of the problems in the justice system is that perpetrators are, are often released without any kind of punishment whatsoever. And there doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be fair, you know, where perpetrators are let go and not needed. So, or very, very little. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem right. So I think maybe an education on, uh, and I know that the, the doctor did mention this too, about educating lawyers and probably magistrates on the issue itself. Definitely. I mean, that speaks to um, a lot of the rehabilitation, that having some kind of intervention, not just locking someone away for however many years or months and then expecting things to change. Yeah. Right? Education. I really just really wanted to highlight again, she mentioned unity, and um, I would love to see um, unity among the agencies, because a lot of the time, um, there will be a lot of individual, Kiman is very small, and um, they'll have one, they'll have a couple of individuals that go to the many different agencies, but they target one problem, one problem, each and like, it would be great if like, um, one member from each agency could come together and talk about individuals and how to help, mm -hmm. how each agency can help. So I think, yeah, just liaison or like unity. Mm -hmm. That would have to be, would have to be done where the only aim and end product was the betterment and support of, of our people. I agree. But that, there's a, that's at odds with the capitalistic environment in which we exist because if your company's gonna make a certain amount of money, my company's gonna make a certain amount of money, the focus is inadvertently, I'm not blaming anyone, but inadvertently it's our acquisition. Whereas that mindset has to change if we're genuinely going to support the people and genuinely enable them to create a collaborative model because the idea of collaboration has to be about the betterment of the person and the support of the person as opposed to carving off a bit more of the pie because there's mutual exclusivity in those ends. If this was church, I would say amen. <laughs> <laughs> you can be anywhere you want to be. <laughs> I would speak from the employment yes, aspect because we deal with it every day. Persons who come in and they're buyers and they're, when you start talking to them, you realize how much deeper it is. I had a man break down crying, he's 50 years old going back to how his mother treated him as a child. And you can see how he now treats his own wife with violence based on what his experience was as a younger child. Why he's turned to drugs, why he's now stealing, and why he was incarcerated, and it's like his background again. One of the things that we are working on though, from that perspective is to have that interagency collaboration. So we're talking about now for the prison, but getting the right counseling, making sure that needs assessment can understand what is needed so they don't come and take advantage of the system at the same time. Um, what kind of training they need to get out there. So that's definitely something that is being looked at. Yeah. And it's something that hopefully the community as a whole will embrace because we need a community to make it work. You know, at the end of the day, it's not just contained with government, it does live outside that world. Exactly. Can I just add one thing? Just if, if you asked how we feel, just try to assess it all. It's not easy, you know. The doc doctor said about putting it on the shelf, or putting stuff on a shelf and kind of not wanting to deal with it. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's ironic for me because I am able to, to deal with things when it's children who are brought to me or concerns. I'm able to go through policy, I'm able to be objective and supportive. However, when you were talking, I thought of it as a father, and that makes me feel violent. So like, the idea that someone would hurt my children, reason disappears, and the kind of angry caveman emerges as like, it's, you know. So I'm just trying to point out that, ironically, that a certain part of looking at this, I'm not, I'm not a violent person, and I've not been violent, but if anyone was to do anything of this nature to my children, I would love to tell you I was well balanced enough to talk to them about it. <laughs> That's not the case. And you know, it's a, it's, I just wanted to point out that it makes, there is definitely an incentive towards violence should anybody hurt my children like that. 
which I guess is at odds with the professionalism of it all. I kind of want to apologize for being violent towards people. Who <laughs> put it up there. Sounds like protection, like protective. Or Annihilation. Protective. <laughs> it's, it's different. <laughs> it's no reason. Add one thing. For me, it's scary as well. And the reason why it's scary is that was only a snapshot. Mm -hmm. And the bigger picture of the where I was. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> it is something you don't want to think about, though, isn't it? It's not just. If I could add another one, is could be maybe sidelined in terms of men. Because so, many, so much of the education or intervention or treatment programs focus on the mother or the female. Um, and whether they, um, well, I'm sure they don't intentionally do this. But very often, men are not um, targeted or communicated properly to or with, and that can uh, that that can exasperate the frustration that they already feel. So that that's when the caveman would would come out. Yeah, it's, yeah. It is important to have both stories, right? Yeah. Not just female story, but to have the male story, to have the male voice, and that's one of the campaigns, the he for she campaign is a strong one right now, and I think that's a way to unite the genders um, for the cause. And I hear, I hear what you're saying, and I know locally, especially, um, it can seem skewed, so we do need to do a better job of bringing in um, the males, you know, because they're not always the perpetrators, um, and they are the, the fathers and the brothers, and, and they have effects as well. So. We need that we're inclusive of that. I was going to say isolated, because I think there actually are several programs in the community, there's lots of training going on, but I think between age agencies there's very little communication. Before we even get to the level of collaboration, there's just the basic communication. What does this agency provide in terms of services? What is this agency offering at the moment in terms of training? We, uh, training is expensive, it's time consuming as well as costly. And if we could even just share with each other what is available, <laughs> it would be helpful for each of us as well as allow us to build relationships that we should have mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I just want to speak on perhaps uh, a solution just from my personal experience. Um, I'm from New York, I just moved on island, but um, working with the Manhattan DA's office, we just launched an event, a youth empowerment event, which brought all the agencies that were working um, with the DA's office together and we literally had a meeting and said this is how I feel that we can like help the community and that's there was a great you know conversation and a phenomenal event and now it's an annual thing so I think just hearing you guys speak I think it's a phenomenal solution here on island and that was at the, the in, in New York City yeah right now, um, I'd like to move on, and if, Lexi, do you want to keep me, I know I'm starting my part a little bit late, just kind of give me an idea when it's 7.15, I'll probably 
probably need a few more minutes, but. Okay, so. So I wanted to present the findings to my dissertation to you today, and it seems to fit in with some of your points quite well. Uh, so I mean, part of me is going to—I'm going to try to skip through the drier stuff. But um, basically, um, it's called the experiences of mental health professionals counseling young survivors of sexual abuse in the Cayman Islands. Uh, I did it last year, uh, and well, the year before that, and last year. And I wanted to begin with this quote. Um, that basically sort of frames the perspective uh, that sort of anchors my study. Traditional models of psychotherapy limit the progress individuals can make because they help individuals learn better to adapt to their environment, an environment that may be pathological and remain oppressive. Although this individual level is important, ignoring pathology at a systemic level complacently perpetuates injustice and circumscribes our professional roles. Consequently, psychologists must step back from the myopic view of the well-being of the individual and take on a systems-oriented approach toward prevention, intervention, and lasting social change. Right? Um, I think we need to get out of that isolation and that lens where we're just dealing one-to-one -one and we need to see this as a bigger picture where we all get in there and work together and don't be afraid to step outside of the box. So the background of my study um, basically was, was um, it originated from some regional studies in the Eastern Caribbean, which technically we were considered a part of because I contacted them and I thought that was interesting. Uh, but it, emerging data from the Caribbean has identified sociocultural systemic influence that sustain the traumatic impact of child sexual abuse, not only on the individual victim, but also on the whole of society. Another quote, it is the social attitudes and behaviors from a wide cross-section of society that sustain the risk environments that children are exposed to. The main issue to be tackled is not so much the individual psychopathologies, again, they do exist, but societal acceptance of violence. The abuse of male power and the socialization of sorry, the socialization of gender norms by both men and women, because women do subscribe to some of those gender norms, which place the status of men above that of, of children. So, if you wanted to look up that study, it's a very um, it's a very good study, Jones and Jenner. So, the relevance of my study um, basically. It, the intent was to discern whether the problem in this literature um, that came up about the systemic implications um, to child and sexual abuse, um, basically if it, if it does have a lot of these implications about our culture and our societal norms, um, do they exist in the Cayman Islands as well, basically? Because there's no real research on the Cayman Islands, or there, there wasn't, the study hadn't come out yet, but looking at the actual Sociocultural factors. So the purpose was to understand the experiences of mental health professionals, specifically counseling young survivors of sexual abuse. It explored the personal, professional, social, cultural, political, environmental, and other systemic influences on the counseling experience of the mental health professionals practicing locally. And it describes how participants, the mental health professionals, contributed to lasting positive change in the lives of young survivors. So did they get out of the box, or did they just keep this one-to-one -one individualistic perspective? So what it did was it, it pioneered literature on child sexual abuse from the Cayman Islands from an academic standpoint. It contributed to the literature in the Caribbean, and it filled the gap of the international literature highlighting the sociocultural norms and how it um, influenced the experiences of mental health professionals. So at the time, the only published reports of CSA, uh, child sexual abuse, were by the Department of Children and Family Services in 2013. Uh, they quoted 214 total cases of child sexual abuse, incest, or defilement since 2000, uh, which averaged out to 15 children reporting sexual exploitation of some sort per year. Clearly, these numbers were low. Uh, there's a lot of underreporting, uh, inaccuracies, inefficiencies, fear, lots of different factors that would contribute to those numbers being low. But 
now we have a little bit more of a, of a picture of those statistics, which um, Kelsey and Grace will get into later. So I just want to clarify the problem that I studied. Because even though the first thing you want to think of as the problem is child sexual abuse, that's not actually what I studied since I spoke to the mental health professionals. The problem that I studied was the disparity between the positive growth promoting treatment that professionals would provide these survivors and the opposite toxic, oppressive environment that these children would exist in. I call it the hole in the bucket phenomenon, right? Because we're trying to do all this great work, but it's just seeping out and you know, you, you don't get any lasting positive change because of all those environmental factors. So what was it like for mental health professionals working with young survivors of sexual abuse in the Cayman Islands who had to contend with this problem? Did they practice with the myopic view, Kakad criticized, or did they extend their scope of practice to help facilitate change in their clients' lives systemically? It illuminated the scope of practice initiated voluntarily, not mandated, uh, by mental health professionals counseling these young sexual abuse survivors. So some of the literature that I reviewed uh, talked about pre-existing risk factors uh, in the, the socio-cultural elements. So Caribbean cultures have traditional pa patriarchal culture, typically marginalizing and exploiting women and children. Uh, the historical influences on the Caribbean social fabric have also included legacy of slavery, the colonial period, and the social and cultural acceptance of child sexual abuse and inefficient reporting procedures. The existence of oppressive belief systems, social norms, and cultural attitudes are embedded in Cayman, and these created an almost, Im almost impossible task for mental health professionals counseling these young survivors. Some of the positive factors, because I think it's important to, to again, have both stories, because there's got to be negative and positive, and we have to look at both sides. But the research has identified this concept called post-traumatic growth phenomenon. It's an alternative outcome for survivors of sexual abuse, whereby they do experience some, not just a return to normalcy of before the abuse, but they actually have an even better outcome, right? So it takes them to an, a, an even bigger, um, better growth um, reality. They have some insights developed, they may have made meaning out of their experience, and they become e an even better person, believe it or not, because despite what has happened. So uh, again, PTG, or post-traumatic growth, uh, it evolved from the idea of protective factors versus risk factors. So protective factors are usually um, addressed uh, for the individual, like the, the psychopathology of an individual. So what are the protective factors to prevent those kinds of negative symptoms in persons? But the new terminology uh, started evolving from victim to survivor to thriver. Right, so you see the, the influence of this post-traumatic growth coming through in the language as it changed. So it's defined as the positive transformation which occurred after a traumatic event beyond the original level of functioning for survivors. Whereas most people think of a rubber band snapping back into place, this goes beyond that. This is an evolution beyond even what, what it could have been before without the trauma. So these positive and transformative experiences after traumatic events were referred to as meaning making, benefit finding, stress related growth, thriving, positive psychological change, adversarial growth, transformational coping, and lasting positive change. So I kind of use the lasting positive change interchangeably with post traumatic growth. So we need to overcome a lot of barriers, clearly. Not only must interventions consider involving the family system in trauma recovery, but also task communities and organizations government and private, to share a role in trauma recovery. Because a lot of times, you know, some of us work in the field, we just, you know, get, they, well, they get dumped, right? The young the abuse survivors get dumped on a treatment provider's lap, and every, everything, all the resolution is supposed to happen in the room. And then they pick them back up, and they expect it, it to all go away. So they need to, we need to realize as a community that we all have a role in trauma recovery. Mental health professionals must therefore be familiar with the various systems involved, including law enforcement, child protection services, and med with medical professionals in order to navigate these barriers to counseling in effectiveness or effective effectiveness. Um, so basically, in order to be successful, we need to consider all these factors. 
we need to move beyond this idea of, of treatment in a vacuum. So even though counseling can be effective on its own, we need to realize that there are other elements that are really important. So a lack of familial support and cooperation may undermine effective treatment. Lack of counseling for offenders may undermine treatment. Economic difficulties, social stigma and power inequality, systemic oppression such as injustices in the legal system and ineffective child protection systems will undermine effective treatment. Interventions involving parents to enhance their emotional well-being, just some kind of support um, for parents, non-offending caregivers of sexual abuse survivors is important. Um, if you just have a child in treatment alone, you may or may not, you might get like, let's say 50% um, positive outcome. But if you involve the parents, it's gonna skyrocket. 90%, not 100, right? So you need to consider that. I mean, a lot of times when we try to run treatment programs for these youths, and their parents are not cooperative, they're just setting these poor children up for failure, and then the treatment providers burn out because you know, it's just a conveyor belt of, of negativity, really, which is very disheartening. So with the parents' participation, there's a greater likelihood that the family and survivor will complete counseling and achieve that positive outcome. So there is a positive shift happening. Um, the literature supports a social justice-informed mental health professional practice which could be an important component of current professional, like just to expect it, to require it, to assume that this is part of our role, rather than you know, feel like you're, you're making the exception every once in a while to stand up or do something extra for a client. So the expansion of the role of mental health professional to include social justice and advocacy may be the solution to the problem. And another quote, while counseling is one way to provide services to clients from oppressed groups, it is limited in its ability to foster social change. Engaging in advocacy, prevention, and outreach is critical to social justice efforts, as is grounding teaching and research in collaborative and social action processes. So these were my research questions. What were the experiences of mental health professionals counseling young survivors of sexual abuse in the Caymans? How did mental health professionals navigate all of those sociocultural factors, environmental factors, in order to achieve the post-traumatic growth outcomes with clients? And how were mental health professionals able to contribute to the lasting positive change in the lives of young survivors? These were the actual interview questions. Can you tell me about your experience working with young survivors of sexual abuse in the Cayman Islands? What personal and or professional influences most impact your work with young survivors? What social, cultural, political, historical, environmental, or other systemic influences most impact your work with young survivors? How do you do the work that you do, given all that we have discussed? How do you do it? How would you describe your role in counseling young survivors of sexual abuse in the Cayman Islands? And how can you help to achieve lasting positive change in the lives of young survivors of sexual abuse in the Cayman Islands? This is intentionally open and vague because I didn't want to lead them in any sort of way. So the research design and methods, it was qualitative, a phenomenological, phenomenological study um, with five mental health professionals it, using a semi-structured semi interview guide. Um, in order to be included, they had to be English speaking and required to have practice for a minimum of two years as a mental health professional with a therapeutic focus on recovery of child sexual abuse kind of hard to find a population of providers, um, so I had to really um, disguise their identities and all that sort of stuff, but we, came, we found five um, through purposive, purposively through local knowledge from the researcher directories and also recruited from word of mouth, basically. So the data analysis, I had to go through the IRB at my school, and there's also an ethics committee that is housed in the hospital that is used for this purpose and is required for any kind of human participant's research. Um, the, the data was protected and organized um, by me. I read the transcripts. Uh, some of this I don't really think I need to go over, but... Um, <coughs> highlighted quotes that provided an understanding of how the participants experienced the phenomenon, and then I analyzed the data by reducing the information into significant statements and arranging them into themes. Because the difference between qualitative and quantitative, a lot of people think of quantitative research, which is all mathematical and statistical and numbers and very concrete. 
Whereas qualitative, it's about the lived experience of people. It's about the shared experience, the essence of what it means to be, in this case, a mental health professional working with young survivors of sexual abuse in the same So it's about the stories, and it's about connecting the stories. Not just comparing them, but really finding significant themes. So some of, those are the findings, the themes that were drawn out from all these transcripts. The first theme was personal experiences, highlighted the calling to the mental health professionals work with young survivors, the impact their work had on them, including vicarious post-traumatic stress and vicarious post-traumatic growth. Basically what that means is that you often think about the stress reaction that the victim has after a trauma whether it's post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic growth. But the professional would also have a contagion factor to that stress level. So in working with someone who is very uh, stressed, maybe experiencing a lot of depression and fear, it can, it can be caught, for lack of a better word, by the mental health professional. And oddly enough, when I first, 10 years ago, started this topic, I came from a very negative perspective and just focused on vicarious trauma on mental health professionals, and I myself became very depressed for several months. And I had to call my professors and tell them, this is not working for me. I have the contagion factor. It was gonna be a whole chapter in my dissertation, but I just ended up changing it. And so the post-traumatic growth came out. Thank goodness. <laughs> so um, the second theme, oh wait, sorry, the last part was their means of self-care and successfully navigating the